Yeah, uh, you are absolutely fine. Uh, please go ahead. Okay, sir. A very good afternoon to one and all present here. I'd like to welcome you all to this amazing webinar on research ethics and how to avoid publishing in predatory journals. Ethics is the activity of a man directed to secure the inner perfection of his own personality. This amazing quote by Dr. Albert Einstein clearly reflects the significance of ethics in an individual as well as in an organization's life. We'd now like to throw light upon what exactly research ethics. Research ethics involves the application of fundamental ethical principles to research activities which include the design and the implementation of research, respect towards the society and other organizations, as well as the use of resources and research outputs, scientific misconduct and the regulation of research. Nowadays, it's become very common to publish articles in the predatory journals. These journals try to attract new submissions by regressive email advertising and high acceptance rates, but they are unable to provide proper peer review and therefore the scientific quality of the submitted article is pretty questionable. This session will surely provide you guidelines on research ethics and how to conduct research responsibly and to ensure a high ethical standard and to avoid publishing in the predatory journals. Uh, this is an announcement which has been made uh, recurring times that I would request you all to please uh, keep your microphones muted. And as far as your questions are concerned, we'll address them at the end of the session. There will be a separate question answer, uh, question answer session will be organized. And till then, you may type your questions in the chat box. We'll, we'll take them one by one. So without any further ado, uh, let's get started. For the inaugural address, I'd like to request our honorable librarian, Girdhar sir, to please enlighten us with his words of wisdom. Sir, could you please start? So you're on mute. I think you're double muted. Right. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Nishchai. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Respected Professor Tikiwal, uh, Professor of Statistics, LNMIT, Jaipur, Dr. Priya Sandy, Assistant Professor, Department of uh, Chemical Engineering, Bits Pilani Pilani Campus, uh, Mr. Ranbir Sidhe, ITPLE Client Services Manager, all participating faculty members, research scholars, students, library professionals, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of uh, the Central Library, LNMIT, I extend a very warm welcome to each one of you for today's webinar on research ethics and how to avoid publishing in predatory journals. Uh, as announced many times earlier, uh, I would like to announce once again, please mute your microphone and also switch off your video just to avoid uh, the noise and also any disturbance during the webinar. Friends, uh, everyone knows it is not so simple and easy to get published, particularly in a peer-reviewed journal. But whoever is doing research, he or she got to publish it, it is mandatory for them. And research ethics as you all know, it focuses on certain principles in research to maintain the integrity of the study, be it honesty, objectivity, integrity, carefulness, openness, transparency, accountability, and honoring all forms of uh, intellectual uh, property, confidentiality, as well as our own uh, you know, ways of uh, looking forward to getting published in, you know, reputed journals, okay. Uh, just to quote an incident, a few years ago, a research uh, student from one of the universities in uh, Madhya Pradesh, she submitted her research article to one of the social science journal uh, online on an assurance by the publisher that it will get published online. Only thing she was supposed to do was she had to make a payment of 5,000 rupees, which she did. And upon making the payment, she got a PDF of her article with all publication details. And also 
she received a certificate to that effect via email. But later on, uh, when she searched her own article, neither she could find the article nor she could find the website of the journal. She does not want to be identified now for obvious reasons. And this is just one among thousands of such cases where researchers for, are falling prey to these kinds of, you know, fake, cloned, predatory journals, a phenomenon that has become extremely rampant in digital age and especially in a post-pandemic scenario. So according to a study in India, the number of research papers that are published in such fraudulent journals could be as high as 3,000 to 5,000 in a year. It is alarming. And predatory publishing charges publication fee from the authors without weighting the quality of the article or looking at the legitimacy of the article. And in spite of that, the researchers are tricked into, you know, publishing in such journals. And uh, even though many of uh, these research scholars or researchers know that such uh, publications are fraudulent, they still go ahead with such kind of an activity just for the want of uh, getting their articles published. Question is, is that right? Okay, to create an awareness, uh, friends, today uh, on this particular issue, this webinar, I'm pretty sure, will help anyone who is concerned about getting published in a quality publication, whether they are at the beginning of their career or they are more experienced perhaps, but still want some more information, some more insight into this particular issue and overcome that kind of, uh, you know, complications. Uh, so today we are indeed extremely, extremely happy and lucky to have with us on board Professor G.C. Tikiwal, Professor of Statistics at LNMIT Jaipur, Dr. Priya Sandy, who is Assistant Professor at uh, Bitspilani Pilani Campus, and Mr. Ranadir Sidhe from IEEE, which is one of the renowned uh, publishing house and they are going to talk to us about uh, not only the research ethics the the requirement of why it is essential to uh, maintain the ethics and also how one should avoid publishing in predatory journals so uh, i now request our master of ceremony nishchai to continue with the proceedings thank you very much uh, thank you so much, sir, for your remarks and for introducing our audience with our very renowned speakers. Moving on with the webinar, before inviting Professor Tikiwal, I'd like to give a brief introduction about him. Professor G.C. Tikiwal is a professor of statistics at LNM IIT Jaipur. He has over 40 years of teaching and research experience in various universities, not only in India, but also in Nigeria, United States. Canada, as well as in Poland. He also has 15 years of administrative experience. Prior to joining LNMIIT Jaipur, Professor Tikiwal served as Dean for Research and Innovation at and Dean Faculty of Science at Manipal University Jaipur for four years. He also served as Dean Faculty of Science and Head of Department of Mathematics and Statistics at Jain Vyas University, Jodhpur, from 2008 to 2011. Professor Tikiwal has two patents and over 40 publications to his credits in national and international peer reviewed journals and has also edited one book and published one monograph. May I now request Professor G.C. Tikiwal to please deliver his opening remarks. I was telling you about Dr. Priya Sandy. She completed her M.E. and Ph.D. from Bits Pilani, Pilani campus. Her doctoral thesis was in the field of CFD simulation of reactors. She has more than 13 years of research and teaching experience and is currently serving as assistant professor at Department of Chemical Engineering, Bits Pilani, Pilani campus. 
She has taught several courses, including thermodynamics, CFD, petroleum engineering, research methodology, and technical communication. She has published with American Chemical Society, Elsevier, Taylor and Francis, Sage and Springer. She has also pursued courses in creative writing apart from engineering. She also researches and writes on creative thinking and engineering education. May I now please call upon Dr. Priya Sandy to highlight the significance of research ethics. Yes, I hope I'm audible. A very good afternoon to all of you. I would like to thank uh, Mr. Giri, Giridhar Kunkur, who has uh, organized this seminar. And I would like to thank all those involved in the organization. Uh, today, uh, I would just like a confirmation of audibility and my slides. Uh, yes, ma'am, you're audible. As well as visible. Thank you. So if we had maybe called this, uh, this um, seminar as how to get published, we would have probably got even a larger audience, right? Because I think today there's a lot of pressure to publish and everybody wants to know how can I get published? How can I get my research paper? But I think it's the very, that very drive, which may be creating certain issues which we need to take care about. And so I've named this uh, presentation as, instead of calling it research ethics, I've named it as uh, the research paper, because ultimately that's what we are looking at. And uh, ethics also relates to critical thinking. And I'll try to show this as we go along. In fact, it uh, even relates to creative thinking. And one thing I'd like to say at the beginning, ethics sounds very heavy and it may be something that you're not very comfortable with talking about, or maybe you think it's, uh, that uh, it's just something that is there to um, stop me from doing what I want, or you may even think that it is going to hamper my research. But I would actually say that the very purpose of publishing a paper is hidden within ethical considerations. In fact, ethical considerations can actually give you long-term principles by which not only you can publish your paper now and today and, re and in this year, but in uh, for, for your continuous um, professional life. So I'd like to start with a story instead of um, going directly to uh, any kind of theory. And uh, all of you, I hope, can see there is a king and there are two, two women here and there is a basket with a baby. And this is actually a historical event which is recorded. And the king is um, King Suleiman or Solomon, as we say in English. And it's a very old date. It's about 970 before. Uh, sorry to interrupt right? you, ma'am, but only the first slide is visible. Oh, okay. So I'll stay on this mode then. It's okay now? Uh, yes, ma'am, it's perfect. Yeah. So this king, uh, Solomon, he had a... Uh, one particular incident where two women came to him claiming that uh, the baby in this basket belonged to both of them and he had to solve this conundrum and the thing that they said was one woman said that uh, she crushed her baby and she actually has taken mine and the same story was said by the other woman so what Solomon did was he looked at both the women and he also looked at the baby. He could not find resemblance. And of course, this is the time before there was DNA testing. Right now, probably we could solve this issue quite easily. But before that, uh, they did not have DNA testing, right? So what he did was he said, OK, let us take a knife and cut this baby into two halves and let us give half the baby to one woman and give the other half of the baby to the other woman and that way we can solve this problem and of course what happened was so uh, so of course when uh, king solomon said you know cut the baby into half give half to one woman give half to the other woman he was taking uh, uh, he was a king actually acting in the place of a judge because in those days the kings had to be very wise and they were actually the judges so when he did that what do you think happened obviously the real mother she screamed and she said no do not cut the baby 
and please give the other woman give her the baby and that's rather obvious because her mother the instincts would not allow the baby to be harmed whereas the other woman who was really not the mother she did not mind if the baby was harmed right so uh, i would just like to ask uh, somebody here can you uh, what do you think about this method that solomon used can you make one comment was it ethical in your view i have just presented a complete case to you and maybe just one person can just unmute and give me one thought do you think it was ethical if so why or if you don't think it was ethical can you please give me your thought so that we can make this uh, interaction a little more lively it's ethical okay why do you think so because they have to decide on that okay they had to make they had to come up with some yeah. answer okay yeah and then so, uh, it has to be finalized with and they have to check it out the situation or that right very good answer excellent answer i think uh, thank you lata m and uh, yeah the thing is uh, what why we may say why did he say that you know the baby should be cut in half that is unethical uh, you know and can you imagine the terror the mother would have experienced so you may say she's terrified that he is going to cut the baby in half but ultimately what happened it revealed the true mother and why is it ethical if you are going to argue that it is ethical the re reason is because of two things justice and rights the justice was maintained the right mother got the baby even though the process may be a little difficult and finally if it had not happened what other option did the king have he would have had to violate the rights of the true mother because they were, would have always been in a uncertain mode right so i think this uh, uh, this story clearly illustrates that sometimes in life we may we may know what is right and wrong but we may actually face difficulty as to how to about it and you may ask the question ultimately what matters and i think the answer is coming from this story justice and rights matter now when we talk about justice and rights you may say do we have a basis for this like varying from person to person uh, what's just for you is not just for me and you know what is your rights it may not be the way i define rights so can we really have something absolute i would just like to show you the triangle which is uh, the elements of the justice system and i'd like to put forward and all of you can see the pink triangle right uh, you can see that this is nothing very that is um, very new we have always lived for 2000 4000 years of civilized society we have lived with a justice system and remarkably all the civilizations of the world have quite a similar justice system over the past thousand years and spe especially over the past 200 years and so this is not something very new there are three elements of any just system one is objectivity objectivity simply means that we are all equal and there is something external to us which is going to judge us so we are there's no bias objectivity you can say is the opposite of bias and the most uh, important part maybe is that this part of the triangle that is the law part now at the law part i just want to talk about two things there may be two kinds of laws you can say one is a moral law where somebody uh, where there's something like right or really right and wrong for example if we say do not steal there is a moral aspect there because if i steal from you then uh, you your rights are suffering so that is something which is uh something which is absolute however we can decide in our parliament on the percentage of tax that we are all going to pay and we can all say we will all pay 15% tax and no more that can also be a law so that is called a consent law uh and we all follow that so i want to distinguish in your mind that there is the moral law and there is the consent law and the final part of the triangle is accountability unless we have accountability uh, there's nobody to really say that uh, uh, all this law and this objectivity has really fulfilled its purpose in justice and rights okay so let us see if our current research system let's put our current research system to the test and let us look into it a little more um in depth and this is my next slide 
And I hope you can see that. I'm trying to show that this entire process of research that we are all in, it is like a big machine. If you can use your imagination, you can think that there are many, many, all these colorful um, arrows. They are showing all the research papers that are going into the system. And then some of many of them are getting rejected. So you can see the arrows going down from the bottom. And mm. finally, you can mm. see only some of these papers are getting uh, published and they are going the forward. Bottom, 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 bottom. And I would like to also say that this uh, system, it can be affected with a back loop. That means depending on what gets published, it can affect backward what is going to get published. So then you would say, what kind of law do we have to, you know, really um, in this research system and what are, what laws? What, okay, it's a system. So what law can, what ethics are we going to impose? So uh, there are many types of ethics and um, I'm showing you what you is called the Kantian ethics. Hello. And this is my next slide. And uh, in Kantian ethics, they say that moral obligations, they have nothing to do with consequences, but they arise solely from a moral law that is binding on all rational beings, right? So uh, why it is ethical is I'm following this not just because I would not benefit from it later on or because something bad will happen to me. That's why I'm doing it. But because actually I'm a rational being, that's why I'm doing it. And then you would say, okay, but then uh, I agree for a basis. We have a good basis why we need to uh, follow certain laws, even when we are um, when we are writing our research and publishing our research paper. But you may say, which laws? So Kantian ethics gives us a very nice answer here. So it says, act only according to that maxim, which you can at the same time will that it should become a universal law. So this simply in simple English means I need to act on those laws, which I also want everybody else to act on. Whatever I'm called to do, I would like that everybody is called to do that. So in our moral law in our country, for example, we do not steal. Otherwise, there is a penalty. Sometimes I would like to steal, but I stop myself from stealing. Why do I stop myself from stealing? Because I know that everyone else is also under the same obligation that they also cannot steal. And that is more beneficial to me that everyone else does not steal than my isolated act of stealing. So I hope that you have got this idea of ethics it is not just being what you do because you are afraid of bad consequences, but something which is much more ingrained in us than we could possibly think. So then what are these laws that uh, we are talking about really? And I'm going to my slide number six here. I hope you can see the law is written and I've sort of put all kinds of uh, small sentences. Right? And I think nothing of these are going to be very surprising to us. All of us know that these are the laws that we could, we need to go we need to be under when we are publishing or in our research work. And uh, I would just like to maybe not just tell the law, but I would like to say what this means and why. So I'm starting with uh, the left hand side, and that is uh, do not falsify data or claims. And I'd like to apply the Kantian ethics that I just now said and sh show you that this is in fact a worthy law. Because if I do not falsify my data or claims, then it follows that others also will not falsify. Hello. Yeah. yeah. Hello. Others also. Excuse me, ma'am. Yeah. Am I audible? Excuse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You are audible, but your presentation is not visible to us. Uh, uh, so slide. please go to the uh, participants, show everyone, and please scroll down to Priya Sandy, ma'am's. Uh, portal and there you will find the presentation option kindly pin that and uh, please ask your doubts in the chat box because this would disturb the flow of the event yeah actually.
Yeah, I do understand. I think you have to pin the you have to pin this onto your screen. Yeah, scroll down and find the speaker and pin the presentation onto the screen. Uh, and so the first thing I said was do not falsify data. If I don't falsify data, others also will not falsify data. Is that good for me? It's very good because then on what basis will I build my research? If I'm looking to maybe um, find some kind of new method of a new drug to, to solve, uh, to uh, heal cancer, obviously, where will I start? My starting point is going to be the literature which is already available, right? And if that literature is in any way false, then I'm on shaky ground. But if this law exists, and as I said, the axiom is you follow what you want everyone else to also follow. It's a great axiom to follow. So you see, obviously, the benefit. It's not just full of restrictions. It is full of benefits. The next one is do not benefit from uh, the work by any other means. That is, do not have a conflict of interest. So conflict of interest simply means that because you're publishing, probably you're getting some other benefits out of it. And uh, it's not difficult to know that, say, you are related to some company, uh, maybe your relative is, is in some company and they are producing some new kind of, uh, say, they are pr producing some new kind of pharmaceutical or some new medicine. And you write a paper showing that medicine is really good and helpful. That's a conflict of interest unless you have really found that to be true. But conflict of interest says that even if your research finds that that drug is true, it's better you do not publish that. It's better someone else publishes that. And I hope you're getting my point because you would always be, if people reviewed your work, they would always see the link and they would always think that you have done this for some other purpose other than research. So a conflict of interest is not so much that you do not do something, but you do not even be seen in a position where there might be a question mark on you. Do not claim more than your data justifies. Now, this is something which is a bit tricky and I've tried to highlight the darkened ones or the bolded ones. And what do I mean by do not uh, justify more than your, do not claim more than your data justifies. The best way and uh, the people who review your papers, they are very experienced and they've gone through hundreds of papers and they know that everything is not going to fit together perfectly. One thing they're going to check is, is the writer making the claim that if the data goes only to this point, they are also only going to this point. They are yeah. over claiming yeah. on their work. Yeah, now that will actually go as a positive for you. Yeah, madam, sorry to interrupt. Yes. Uh, your slides are not being seen actually. Okay, I could present them again. No, your presentation is just not seen by anybody. And I guess so. Okay, I will present it again. Mr. Can you please confirm? It is visible, sir. It is visible. Achha. Okay, yes, thank sir. you. Uh, if it is visible, then continue, please. Because Can I continue, sir? Uh, problem is at your end. Yeah. So. Uh, I'm continuing. So another uh, law or another aspect we, we would say is do not be willfully yes. negligent. Uh, I hope I'm audible. And uh, by do not be willfully negligent, uh, what I'm saying is we cannot actually uh, publish something which we know we have not double checked or triple checked. Now I'll show you how this can also be a positive for you. When you publish your work and you say that the data in my graphs, we have done some experimental work and we have done this data on triplicates. Many people, when they do their experiment, they don't just do one experiment. They do it three times and they take the average data. This is a very good practice. Now you are showing that you are not negligent. And this kind of thing actually helps you when you're, you're being peer reviewed. Also, another way of showing that you are not negligent is to show error bars. That is, you're showing that your results are not just absolute values, but there is some plus or minus error. And I'm sure many of the audience do know about these things. I'll just take one more before I go forward. Uh, do not be data selective to fulfill a preconception. Now, this is a difficult issue because uh, you cannot present everything in your research paper, right? You are going to present only one or 
few parts of the work that you did and therefore you have to select but you must select in such a way that you are not willfully deceiving anyone as to the entirety or the wholeness of your work so you cannot be what we call cherry picking and it's much better to show the entire uh, entire uh, realm of data that you have. In fact, I would say nowadays many journals, they prefer that rather than you show something yes or no, that say, for example, you are uh, again researching on some kind of a drug and you say, yes, this drug has very high effic efficacy. If you're not getting high efficacy, you may be getting many other things. And people would want to know all those other things as well. Maybe you're getting only 50% efic efficacy. Maybe there's a variation when uh, temperature is varying, the efficacy is going up or down. So it's not about saying yes or no, but it's about presenting a complete study. It's about painting a picture. It's about telling a story. It's about giving a message. And this is what uh, your data needs to do. And that, that those are the best kind of journals. They love those kind of papers. And they are the good journals where they see that you are actually attempting to uh, give a story rather than just say yes or no and have a very preconceived notion in your mind. So I would like to uh, go ahead and uh, talk about how do I know that uh, this system is working uh, well or how does this, uh, how do I know that this whole process of this research system, this publication process, we submit our journals, we, we are rejected, we get some, some of our papers get published and it goes on. How can I say that the system is working properly? Maybe up to now you never even thought about this. Maybe you thought I just need to think about my paper. What, what else do I need to think about, right? But if we don't think about the entire research publication process and we are not concerned about it, maybe tomorrow we will not have that process. We will not have that system. And it is up to us to take care of the health of that system. So just to give you an ana analogy, we may say that there are so many cases which are running in the courts, the high courts and so on. So it's really a bad system. But supposing we did not have court system, then where will you go if you have problems, if you have a case? So rather than saying the system is slow, I think we need to change our thinking maybe and say that uh, we are grateful to have a system and is the system working properly and be concerned about that. So I'll give you a few points about what is when the system is working properly. So a moderate number of papers are processed. That means uh, when we have so many journals, if we are getting so much a publication at uh, say thousands of papers are getting published, you may think it's good for you. My six papers got published. My 10 papers got published, right? But it's not good for the system overall. Why? Because I can very well question, uh, you know, how authentic are those papers? Can people really peer review and give 10 papers? Uh, can that really happen? Uh, isn't that system running on overload? And there can be a question mark on your, on the peer reviewing also of the journals. So I believe many good journals, they actually, try to uh, slow down the process by giving you lots of reviews. So when you get a lot of reviews, you need to be grateful for it. And you need to think that that's a good journal if they are giving me reviews uh, because they are trying to moderate the number of papers that are processed. If too many papers are processed in the publication system and all the publication houses, it's a wrong signal. And I think we are sort of in between in the in between place where we could be tipping over into having too much of too much of publication. Uh, the next point is that the reviewers need to focus on the claims and not on the agreement. It's a good system when the reviewers are, they are not worried, do I agree with this research? No problem. So as I said, uh, the reviewers are doing their job when they are focusing on the claims. They are not saying, do I agree with this research? Is it what I feel? Is it what I believe as a researcher? Or is this result matching with my thinking? But they are actually seeing the whatever the evidence that the person is sharing in the research paper. Then you, the, the, the entire system is working well. Also, another thing is, I think there's a lot of uh, talk about novelty. I'm sure as a researcher, all of you have felt that we have to have novelty. We have to have novelty. Everyone is after novelty. But in fact, if something is, if there is every time, everything is novel, there's no basis from which something comes, right? We need to go to the next level. We need to go incrementally. So I think this too much overstress on novelty may not help the system to function at its best. 
Moreover, it's uh, the second the second last point is related to the point of novelty, and that is when we move laterally and we think in a more creative manner, we can have new areas to explore. And the final point is uh, the system is working well when there are several in one journal, there are several approaches being applied for one topic. OK, so I would say we need to be concerned about these things uh, in the in our uh, research, the research journal environment. And even as scientists and researchers, we need to check up and uh, check on these things. And I would just like to tell you another story, and this will go, this will go very fast. All of you can even find it on uh, YouTube, and this is the secret life of Dr. R.K. Chandra. Now, this is a very sad story. It is the story of a, a, a doctor, medical doctor, who did a lot of research work, but he did not have any accountability from the very beginning of his work. He was working in baby uh, formulation of baby food, and uh, even before his nurse could recruit the babies for the study, he already published the paper. And he would publish about 10 to 11 papers. He was actually working in Memorial Hospital, Memorial University, which is in Canada. And the university started to have doubts about him. He was a renowned doctor. But when they found that uh, even his very, his assistant, was uh, saying that I'm not even uh, related to this paper and still my name has come in the paper and there were 10 to 11 papers and then the story went one after the other all the grants were falsified in fact he even had a own his own fake university and finally all the grants money he used it for that fake university and the story goes on and on moreover he even affected the companies that he worked for because whatever research he gave there was no basis to that so you may say, but nothing happened to Dr. Chandra. And the story happened in the 1980s and 90s, and it got resolved in the 2000s. And you know, what accountability did he face? I would uh, suggest that can we look in the opposite direction? Can we think of how many people, how many people's rights were violated by his activity? There were many, many researchers because his paper was getting published, their paper could not get published. Even his own assistants they were later threatened by him because if they uh, you know wanted to out him and the university had a very difficult time about what to do so what i'm trying to say this is maybe an extreme case but if we are not going to hold ourselves accountable uh, many people are going to get harmed along the way we may think it's just a matter of writing something in a paper but when it comes out in black and white and it sticks on your name then it's no longer just a matter of one or two years, but it's a matter of your lifetime profession. I would like to uh, come to the end of my talk uh, by giving us a word of hope. And uh, in this slide, I would uh, say that the best way to misuse, uh, to stop avoid misuse is to for right use, right? So uh, what I'm saying is the answer to misuse is correct use. And there are a few things that uh, will uh, really help uh, which uh, there are some uses which avoid misuse completely. The first is, of course, please avoid ghost authorship or gift authorship. Yes. And why this is bad or wrong? Because uh, in the long term, people can easily see when they see all your list of uh, papers, they can easily link you to your colleagues and they can very easily understand when you go, for example, if you come to a good university like Bitspilani recruitment, they're not going to see the number of was you published but they are going to look into yeah. the quality of the paper you published and that you do not have ghost authorship and gift authorship because your paper publication also talks about you as a person about your integrity and your honesty also another thing i want to tell you about the publication process uh, don't be disheartened if you don't get two papers per year or something like that i've shown you a picture of grapes here and the reason why is mostly our uh, outcome comes in stages. This is the nature of any kind of scientific activity that we suddenly get fruit. And the way fruit come, they don't hang alone. They come in clusters. So you may find that suddenly I've been working for two years, two, three years, and you will get a cluster of papers if you don't give up. The next thing is uh, always try to publish your paper where you can align with the rigor of the work. Now, the levels of journals, actually, they are not there to say which journal is going to publish good work or bad work. 
but they tend to go by how much rigor is there in your work. Are you giving sufficient data? Are you giving triplicates? Are you giving uh, the length of your article? So that is a rigor. And so it is better that you only send your work. Don't try to, uh, you know, uh, hit upwards. That is, don't try to publish in journals, which are not, you already know that they are too high for the standard of your work. Align yourself honestly with whatever journal you feel is for your work. Supposing you have got a very rigorous paper, send it to a top journal. If you have got a paper where you have some minimal results and you still want to get it published, do not try to hit, a, hit on a top journal because that would simply be wasting time for the publisher and it will just be delaying your work and it will be creating clogs in the system. Another thing that we need to look at what even the journal wants. If we want the best out of the journals, we need to also help them. Mostly the journals, they have this one complaint that everyone just gives the results. They do not describe the results and they do not, sorry, they do not explain the results. So what I mean is don't just show your graphs, but you try to bring up a theory behind it. Explain why that's happening. That's your job. And that relates to my next point. Everything is 50% work, 50% contemplation. If you're in research and you finished your experiments, it only means that 50% of your work is done. You need to think and contemplate about your results. And over that period of time, you'll get very wonderful things. And then you need to write your paper. I would give the analogy of a cow. Uh, you know, they chew the cud and then they allow the cud to go to one of their multiple stomachs. And then they bring the cud back and they chew it some more. And in that way, they, they get all the nutrition out of the cud or the grass, right? So in the same way, we need to contemplate on the results we have got. And once we get that, get all the nutrition out of our results, you can write a really good paper. So don't rush the process. Think that half my time should go in the research, uh, actual physical activities, and half the time should go in the writing activities. And you cannot force results in your research. You cannot preconceive things, but you can be attentive to the direction of your research. Say your research uh, is not going the way you want it. You can change your direction. Because the whole point of research is not to get what you want, but to discover new things. And people sometimes they are afraid to research in what excites them because maybe that's not the thing that's going to get funded or for some other reason. But you know, ultimately, if the research doesn't excite you, you're not going to, it's not going to show in your research paper. When you write, if you are excited about your work, you will have an exciting message and your research paper will be that much more, uh, it'll be that much more engaging. I would also like to uh, ask you to consider to diversify. By diversify, I mean sometimes we are teaching in a certain discipline, say we are teaching in engineering and say, for example, I research in CFD. But when I teach CFD also, I'm very interested in teaching. So nowadays I even publish papers on my teaching that is in education. And there, there I've opened up another avenue. I've also opened up another avenue about creative thinking in engineering education. So that way you don't have to get stuck on just one or two uh, areas of research. You need to think about diversifying and spreading out into other areas of research. I want to just talk about the impact factor and open access. Uh, impact factor, I would like to say it's something which is good. It's a helpful gauge of a journal. However, it is something which also reflects uh, how much that particular uh, that particular topic is in vogue right now. So you can say, for example, hydrogen production is very much in vogue and some, some of the journals just have very high impact factor, four, six. So should I just publish in that journal? Now, the point I'm trying to make is impact factor can vary over decades. It may be six now and it may change. It may go down to two or three or four. So. Uh, so same with open access. Some people think that we should never publish in open access. Open access is bad. Or some people think, okay, publish in open access. What I'm trying to say is these things are slightly secondary. The most important thing that you need to think is, is my topic falling very nicely into this journal's scope? irrespective of the impact factor, irrespective of it being open access. And I would like you to also consider that there are some specialized open access journals. For example, I also work in the field of petroleum and many countries, they have petroleum journals and they, are, they have open access journals where they do not uh, actually charge. So you must consider even these smaller journals where it is open access, but they do not charge you anything. 
And uh, so these are, I hope these are some points which will encourage you and to tell you something more about the research process and help you to use and not to misuse. And with that, I've come to the end of my talk and I'd like to thank you for your kind attention. Uh, yeah, I think uh, thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, before we move uh, further, oh, may I please request Professor G C Tikiwal to please mute himself. Uh, Professor Tikiwal, please keep your mic on mute. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Priya Sandy, for your kind words. You truly explained us the actual meaning of the this amazing quote by Kant, which says, "Ethics is knowing the difference between what you have the right to do." And what exactly is the right thing to do? Yeah, uh, Mr. Uh, yes, sir. So you can next person you can invite Dr. Tikiwal only. Uh, uh, okay, sure. that will be better. Yeah, thank you. Okay, okay, sure, sir. So moving on with the flow of the event, we have with us Dr. Tikiwal. Uh, I guess I have already introduced you all uh, about his accomplishments and uh, and his amazing sense of research. May I now request Dr. Tikiwal to please come up and give his remarks on the topic. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Nikshe. I hope now I am audible. Uh, yes, sir, you are audible. Oh, good. So uh, now, well, we have uh, just uh, heard Professor Priya from Bits Plani, and she has uh, already told us about the importance of today's webinar's topic that is research ethics and how to avoid predatory journals. And she gave a very good uh, suggestions about uh, like on the falsifying of the data and on the other aspects of research that how the research is to be carried out ethically and why it is important. So uh, looking importance of today's webinar's topic, the research ethics and how to avoid predatory journals. The University Grants Commission approved and made it compulsory in 2019, a course on research and publication ethics for PhD scholars. And the aim of the course is to develop good academic research approach and also to attitude and aptitude towards research in our research scholars. So in that respect, if I look at the contents of this uh, course, then this contains the philosophy of research and science then scientific conduct and the research ethics. And it also, con uh, it also consists of the areas on publication ethics and different topics under that. And then open access journals about it and how you uh, locate the predatory journals to avoid getting into trap into that and also uh, it con uh, it consists of the uh, contents like uh, database and the matrix where uh, you can see that uh, it uh, various when the number of journals are available uh, for the publisher for the researcher, then how he can uh, how he can select on this also, Professor Priya has given you certain guidelines that you don't go by the just by impact factor, but you also uh, look at some other uh, aspects also of your work. And uh, about uh, also uh, the this course gives uh, that. Uh, he introduces the number of softwares available to check the plagiarism. So now the question is, what is the origin? How uh, this problem to start a course or to develop the guidelines 
have come into force. So if uh, we look at the past, and then uh, we can see that nowadays a number of organizations all over the world, they have come out with the guidelines for to conduct the research ethically. And some such are under the Nuremberg Code that was given in 1947 and then the World Medical Association's guidelines. Uh, also, the guidelines provided by the American Psychological Association and for engineer professionals, the National Society of Professional Engineers. Now, all such guidelines and other guidelines at national and international level uh, came into force because when it was noted that the number of case studies, number of the researchers, number of researches were conducted unethically, then the necessity was felt and if I quote some such cases, then the first case, uh, if I just uh, remember, that is uh, the uh, a, a case study, uh, a research done by Professor Watson, a professor of psychology, and he wanted to see the effect of the loud sound on a baby. And for that, he involved a eight years boy, Professor Watson, otherwise known as the father of behaviorism. Some unethical issues were involved in this his research study. The other number of experiments uh, were carried out during World War II by Germany under the Nazis regime. And in those experiments, the human captives were used and number of ethical or the ethical unethical methods were used. And those experiments, in fact, uh, were carried out for the political and military benefit rather than the general benefit for the public. And last to quote one more case is the case, uh, the research was carried out in uh, United States of America by Tuskegee Institute on syphilis patient. On the treatment, they wanted to see the effect of the syphilis treatment. And for that, they picked up the black patients who were suffering with the syphilis. And they withdrew the treatment from those patients to see that what is the effect of this. So all such cases came into limelight. It was brought in the light by the, especially by the media. And then the necessity was felt. And so now we have the guidelines for basically for the clinical trials. We have just uh, have gone through a very uh, dark phase that is the COVID uh, situation where the number of uh, uh, drugs have been developed, number of uh, medicines have been developed to treat or to stop the COVID sickness. So uh, all these things takes a long time to develop. So it becomes very necessary that the research should be carried out ethically because a lot of people are involved. So especially one should, as, as Dr. Priya said that one should be very, very much uh, be clear about his data. There should not be falsifying of the data. Now, when the question comes of to publish ethically, there used to be a time when 
there used to be a limited number of journals available in each subject. And it was easy to keep an eye that what, what which articles or what articles have been published in those journals. And also, uh, it was not difficult for researchers to pick up the journal where they want to publish their work. But over a period of time, the number of journals in each subject have been increased significantly. And also, now we have open access journals. So, the two things comes uh, uh, under this to be considered. Number one is how to the plagiarism cases, because when the number of plagiarism cases were recorded, what came in limelight, then the in the process, we developed a number of softwares to check the plagiarism. And also the number of indices have been developed to know the what type of journal it is like we talk about uh, professor priya talk about the impact factor of course this is not the only index which should be considered before you send your paper for publication so all these things you know uh, are very very important for the research scholars and for the young faculty as well so, and to uh, make the people more aware, the many media, many publishing houses with the journal have come out with the guidelines for their, uh, for their people who want to publish their work in their journals, for their authors, I should say. So, uh, once it is, uh, once uh, he wants to, uh, once a researcher wants to publish a paper in a particular journal, then he should go through the guidelines provided by the, by that journal and see that he fulfills or whether his research work pertains to the scope of the journal. And as according to that, he should pick up that journal and uh, then decide to send the paper and keeping all those points in mind, which just Professor Priya uh, pointed it out. So I think with that, uh, uh, I leave this platform for our uh, second guest speaker. Thank you. Over to uh, uh, Mr. Nishche. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for your informative speech. It truly was very informative. Uh, now let's move on to the next topic of our today's event, which is regarding the predatory journals. Uh, so to throw light on predatory journals and to guide us with the precautions one has to follow during the research, uh, we have a second speaker with us, Mr. Ranbir Sehde. Uh, I would now like to, uh, first of all, introduce Mr. Ranbir Sehde with our audience members. Uh, he, he works with IEEE customers in India, Middle East, Asia, Africa, Bangladesh since 2017. He also has over 14 years of experience in information technology industry, and he has held positions at Dell International, HCL Learning, and Educom Solutions Limited. Prior to joining IEEE, Mr. Ranbir was a senior manager of client engagement at Global Information System Technologies, and a lead team of professionals who trained end users on various publisher products. He was also a part of team who provided customer technical support. He has degree in computers from Punjab University Chandigarh and masters from Amity University Noida. Mr. Ranbir is a certified professional on Microsoft and Cisco platforms. May I now request Mr. Ranbir to please deliver his talk. Sir, over to you. Am I audible now? Uh, yes, sir, you're audible. All right. Let me just share my screen with all of you. Mm -mm -mm. Okay. Is it visible now? Yes, sir. 
Yes, it is. How about now? This is full screen, right? Yes. Yes, it's visible. Yeah. All right. Uh, very good evening to everyone. <clears throat> I think I'm still absorbing, and you, you know, after listening to uh, Priya, ma'am, and after listening to uh, our keynote speaker. Uh, there is a lot of discussion on open access and open science. I think she has uh, given me the right momentum to, you know, carry forward with my talk, which is uh, which is I'm giving for the first time because uh, I represent IEEE client services that contributes world's one third literature in the field of electronic, electrical and computer science. So typically me and my team, we are responsible to spread awareness on uh, on our platform, uh, you know, that helps you in your research and innovation. But today, uh, all thanks to uh, Giri sir that he has motivated me to speak on this topic, which is uh, on, uh, you know, how to be very careful of predatory publishers or predatory journals. So, you know, uh, a way to guide your authors in publishing their work while protecting their career and their institutions. So, I will try my level best to uh, give justice to what uh, Priya ma'am has delivered in sync with her. And, uh, you know, to all of you who are listening to me and have expectation to understand the definition of predatory publishers and predatory journals, because we can only defense when we have a defined guideline and there is a uh, article from nature and uh, that is there on my last slide which will help you to understand because until or unless something is not being defined properly i think it is very difficult for us to uh, you know defense that so without taking any further i will uh, you know quickly start my presentation but as today everyone is talking about open access and open science and after this plan s and coalition s project I, as an individual, have a very strong feeling that future is all about open access and open science, you know, but today I'm not here to speak on, I mean, on open access and open science, but on predatory journals. Uh, but these two have a relationship. The open access system is abused explosively by increasing number of so-called predatory journals and publishers. And now hundred of them are in uh, medical field these predatory journals or publishers you know ask a very high fees as uh, priya ma'am has mentioned to authors for rapid electronic publication but they offer no editorial services manuscripts are published as soon as apcs are being paid you know since open access are linked with apcs thus unfortunately i mean many tend to journalize open access journals and consider all of them, whether it is from IEEE, whether it is from Alzevier, whether it is from uh, ASME or ASC, uh, like of a very inferior quality, you know, that's a very regrettable misunderstanding, I would say. Uh, predatory journals are not at all indexed in major bibliographic databases such as PubMed, Web of Science, Scopus, or you know, uh, in many cases, they cannot be traced because they are not uh, indexed on all these platforms. And what I recommend that as a senior, as a serious author, you should never publish in these journals. Instead, choose a respectable or a highly cited journal with open access. Like in IEEE, we have a mega journal, which is IEEE Access that accepts manuscripts from 16 different topical areas. Now, uh, before we dwell further into today's topic, let me start with a brief introduction of who we are and what we do and how we are helping students, faculty members and researchers to accelerate their research and innovation. So we are world's largest technical professional organization with the mission of advancing technology for the benefit of humanity. How are we achieving this? We have uh, close to 200 journals, active journals that accepts manuscripts. We sponsor and co-sponsor uh, 
more than 2000 conferences every year that means five to six ieee conferences are happening every day somewhere in the world we are also known as a leading standard developer uh, i'm sure that most of you are connected to this webinar through your uh, laptops and if you go ahead and try to understand the wi-fi uh, the hardware configuration of your laptop you would see the wi-fi card is built on ieee 802.1 which is still an emerging standard which is not a fully developed standard when i say it is an emerging standard so we are working on this from last almost uh, long before i was born you know uh, more than 40 years uh, ieee today is inspiring a global community of innovation uh, the IEEE, you know, information is more than just electrical engineering and computer science because when it comes to IEEE, we always think it is all about electronic, electrical and computer science. But IEEE want to look at a big picture and solve global prob problems. So, so what does it mean? So we expand and enable diverse communities to help individuals from around the world to share, collaborate, network, debate and engage with one another just a very close sneak peek on uh, the total content repository that we have in terms of journals so as i said that we have close to 200 active journals out of which 160 are hybrid journals that allows you to go behind the paywall or if you want to pay from your pocket you know uh, you want to gain more discoverability uh, uh reachability or more, more citation then uh, the open access option is also available for you there are fully open access topical journals they are more than 20 plus to be precise there are 25 active open access journals that we have recently launched these are 25 new opportunities that we have created that are in the best interest of authors, uh, reviewers, funders, and uh, this plan as IEEE Access is our mega journal that accepts manuscripts from 16 different topical areas with a very high impact factor. But again, as one of the speakers said that let's not solely depend upon impact factor because, uh, you know, let's say that I have five impact factors in front of me and like one of that is let's say 2.6 and then 0 0.5 and then 5.6 how would i understand that this impact factor is good or bad so this is just a mathematical formula this is a computation that gives you an understanding on the popularity of a journal however until or unless you don't have an impact factor from the similar subject areas let's say if i want to compare uh, impact factor of a journal from a medical journal i should have access to 100 of journals only then i'll be able to know whether this 0 0.5 or 5.6 is a good impact factor or not so to cut the long story short please don't solely depend upon impact factor whenever you are uh, you know deciding your time and energy or efforts into any publication so coming back to the topic of the day that is uh, be aware of predatory publishers how to guide your authors in publishing your work um, although it's rewarding uh, you know the publishing process can sometimes be very challenging challenging for an author it requires authors to be extremely thorough in their research and findings follow the best practices in scholarly publishing and do their homework to learn specific publisher requirement because every publisher requirement be it ieee or elsevier have a different do's and don'ts have a different article posting policies have a different requirement when it comes to submission or reviewed or being published the submission acceptance publication process can sometimes takes weeks to months and as you know in ieee uh we have 200 journals like in Algeria, they have more than 5000 journals the 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 peer review process it varies with the sub to pub time it varies from four to six weeks to 50 weeks and there are reasons because when we are submitting our manuscript to an open access journal 
there is a dedicated team you know the team who is getting paid rather than when we are submitting to a journal who which is a traditional journal everyone in that team is a volunteer right so in ieee we send manuscript when it comes to traditional uh, publication to five reviewers with an expectation that two of them would get back to us and sometimes they take time because this is not what they are doing for living right because this is what they are doing to improve their profile or this is what they are doing as a volunteer there is no uh, you know enforcement on uh, sub to pub time and when we have a lot of uh, papers uh, you know when we have a lot of uh, submissions there are a lot of rejections and rejection is very likely out outcome because the vast majority of papers submitted to a reputable scholarly journal will will always get rejected for an example ieee access in ieee access though it is a fully open access journal 70% of their papers are rejected so it receives for the consideration 70% of their paper however these quality standards and subsequent rejections are are what i feel is benefit to scientific process and the scholarly community and the uh, selective uh, selectively uh, you know the the often adds to the reputation of the journals and i think that would uh, strongly increase the citation of the articles and in addition to raising the level of quality of corpus of scientific literatures authors also have the opportunity to take feedback from the reviewing experts you know take work to the next level and finally put all their uh, work together to publish a new and improved Im improved published uh, paper in a leading journal so how to identify and avoid these uh, predatory pub publishers so there has to be some uh, you know red flags now taking advantage of this there are publishers offering a quick and easy and that is called shortcuts to publication and and we call them as predatory publishers they are profit driven they take advantage of prospective authors desired just to you know uh, because authors want to get published uh, very easily and very frequently and uh, they would also offer guarantee to the publication through a quick and easy process on the basis of a fees there are there are apcs that's why i when i was studying this whole topic what i felt that all those publishers who have open access journals and there are apcs linked with them those all those journals and publications would come uh, in a same you know a consideration that whether these are predatory journals because they are charging us right so yeah so why should you avoid predatory journals and this is important sometimes publish under a journal similar uh, you know a journal name which is similar to a reputable publisher like in ieee uh, many of our conferences or journals uh, they starts from ieee international conferences on the, let's say on photonic on on uh, particular topic so this is this is what these predatory publishers or journals would always uh use in order to confuse the prospective authors like as i said that they would always use the word international in their emails you know like ieee international conference or journal now using these practices they often mislead the researchers into thinking that they are legitimate or they are aggressively solicit research manuscripts which they quickly accept and publish without a peer review process there is no peer review process in predatory journals with no regard uh, for the quality of the papers so you know they often publish flawed papers that most reputable scholarly journals or publishers would reject so accepting these quick and easy route to publishing that could actually be very damaging to authors career and you know of course it would 
invalidate years of works and research and that can even harm the reputation of the author and their institution because author represent the institutions institution represent the authors there is author affiliation so that would harm both so now the uh, question is this that what are the different uh, ways that we can spot or avoid these predatory publishers so i am going to explain you one by one um suspicious so call for papers if you receive a call for papers email from a journal that you're unfamiliar with please please review it thoroughly is this email tone perhaps overly informal are they using this word international or you know uh, are they practically uh, guaranteeing you that your work will get published if so please take it as a red flag you know so i mean after this event i can share with you an example of a legitimate call for paper from an established reputable journal that you can compare that you can do as a comparison that you know if you are receiving an email or if you are receiving an email from ieee or asme or elsevier what would be the different reputation of the publisher uh, just a second yeah reputation of the publisher so are you familiar with the publisher if so check with the colleagues to see if they have information or look for the information on a social media like mendeley facebook uh you know zoha and messages from abroad related to your field does this publisher website look professional do they have a complete contact details like in ieee we have uh, more than 10 to 12 offices throughout uh, scattered all over globe and uh, i mean you go to our uh, website which is ieee.org it will give you a to z of all the contact details from all the technical societies everything right uh, journal quality uh, this is also important and as i said that uh, one of the many factors that academia completely uses is accessing journals quality in citation metrics so there are uh, ultimatrix score impact factor eigen factor and recently we have also uh, started capturing the uh, cite score from scopus so that also would help you would give you an understanding and this is not just with ieee as i said that all other publishers also capture all these different parameters to help uh authors uh, to understand that how well they are indexed it's all about index indexing in all these different platforms editorial board uh, again it's a journal editorial board listed online uh, so uh, today there is orchid id today there is web of science today it is uh, inspec it is uh, a scopus that gives you an understanding on the authors on the editors profile right if if, if you are trying to understand the profile of an editor then uh, definitely that editor is or was author in his uh, experience so you will definitely get uh, all those different uh, information or knowledge on these different uh, indexing platforms uh, coming to indexing uh, again is the journal listed in uh, one of the scholarly uh databases doaj that is directory of open access that can also help you these are the databases that typically have process in place to evaluate the journals are properly indexed or not right and uh, again i can share you a link where you can see that all ieee journals are uh, indexed on all these different indexing platforms editorial and publication practices now every publishers have their editorial and publication practices and all these practices are public you know if a journal requires a transfer of copyright for a publishing an open access article then there may be a red flag and there an example that i can share with you through the slide you know publishing principles and guidelines from ieee for from any other publishers peer review uh, this is this is this is very important and again this is something what predatory journals are not doing 
this is an important benefit in getting published for an author and an opportunity to receive a feedback on your work from peers and as i said that not many all predatory journals do not offer peer review since the goal of these people is only to get published as much as possible so you should always explore the publisher website to find out more about the peer review process all the publishers would give you a clear understanding whether they are doing a single uh, blind or a double blind peer review and that will tell you that what all different stages that your manuscript will go through right so you know does the journal site mention its acceptance rate which should not be too high in case if you see an acceptance rate which is more than i would say 25 to 30 percent it's a red flag because any publisher uh, you know considering all those uh, plagiarism services that are available today be it turnitin and all these services are like ai based that's what i personally feel so anything which is more than 25 to 30 percent is not accepted but if any publisher or any journal they are asking you to uh, get it accepted in more than 40 percent or 50 percent that means this is a red flag so is this is there something which again it's it's not quite right about a journal that you feel and you're unable to understand what is it so you should always ask for help keep in mind that you are putting your professional reputation at stake with your publishing decision and if you have any question or concern about a journal you should always contact your university librarian like in this case mr girish uh, kunkur is there uh, who is uh, very well experienced and understand this whole concept even better than me uh, to be very honest so they can help you to ensure uh, which particular journal you should choose uh, you know how you should write your article and again i mean if you are still unsure uh, if a call for paper of a journal is actually from a known publisher let's say such as ieee or elsevier you can always feel free to contact the publisher publisher always have their direct contact address you can always write an email to a publisher that can uh, and they will definitely if they are not responding to you again there is there is a red flag so as you can see that predatory journal publishing has a potential to harm author's career and institution's reputation and they can dilute the quality of scientific information which is again for the whole public for everyone however we all that is publishers librarian uh, libraries and institutions can work together to educate authors and provide them with the guidance and tools that are needed to get their work recognized and publish in a legitimate scholarly journal to gain exposure of their work and advance their career so uh, as the as the slide title says the path to publishing in a scholarly journal can be challenging but it is well worth the reward of the authors and the institution and the scientific community now um as i said in the beginning we can only defense if we know who is our enemy you know there has to be a definition of enemy so this is a article from nature uh, and uh, this is just a 3 to 4 pages article i would highly recommend you to read this article this is my last slide by the way so what we need is the consensus on the definition of predatory journals because this would provide a reference point to the researcher to the authors into their uh, you know influence and that would help in crafting current intervention like you know uh, they have the data points okay these are uh, point number 1 point number 2 point number 3 that tells me that give me that that are giving me a red flag that okay this is a predatory journal so to hammer out on such a consensus and to map solutions uh, as i said that this is an article where researchers met in ottawa canada like just 2 years before in 2019 3 years before so there were 43 participants 
coming out of 10 countries representing uh, different departments, domains like societies, research funders, researchers, policy makers, uh, libraries, uh, uh, you know, patent partners. And their focus was on biomedical science, but the recommendation, the definition that they have defined, which is there on my slide, should apply broadly to all the disciplines. So the consensus definition was predatory journals and publishers are the entities that prioritize self-interest at the expense of scholarship and are characterized by the false and misleading information, deviation from the best editorial and publication practices, lack of transparency, as I said in all my slides, and the use of aggressive, the word international that I use, indiscriminate solid, uh, solidization uh, practices, right? So with this, I will stop sharing my screen. If uh, you have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for your informative speech. Now move on to the last segment of this event, which is a quick question answer session. Uh, thank you for all those who have posted their questions in the chat box. We have taken a note of each one of them. Uh, I would request Dr. Priya Sandy and uh, Dr. Professor G.C. Tikiwal and Mr. Ranveer said take the questions. And meanwhile, if there is anybody who still wishes to ask questions, you can just paste them in the chat box. The first question which we have got is uh, for Priya Sandy, ma'am. Uh, Ma'am, Mrs. Dinesh Kumari is asking that could you please give an example of falsification of data? Yeah. So falsification of data uh, broadly means you have not carried out that experiment, but you are giving that data in your uh, research paper. Or you have got some results which you know are true and you have changed the numbers. So that is falsification. Uh, I hope I've answered. Uh, thank you, ma'am. I guess it's clear. Uh, second question is also for you. Uh, we have got uh, pretty many questions. Uh, second one is for research scholars doing PhD, should we focus on publishing articles or focus on publishing the research work of our PhD program? This question has been asked by uh, Mr. Rivanti. Please focus on your PhD program because in your PhD program, you're going to learn about science. And once you love science, you can publish. You need to know about your topic first. That's your main job. In time, your publications will come, but don't try to break these two Otherwise, you will be under stress all the time. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, I guess uh, Mr. Devanti has now been able to distinguish. Uh, next question we have for Ranbir, sir. Uh, Deputy Librarian Geetam is asking that uh, how a new user will know whether this journal is predatory or not. So could you please briefly describe? Yeah, so as I said on multiple occasions that uh, there are uh, multiple red flags when I mean if someone is asking you a money upfront uh, and showing you that you will get published in less than a week or a month and uh, they are not traceable, there are multiple red flags and I can share the slides on that. As I said that uh, you can, you know, uh, try to understand the publisher's website. You can uh, take help from your libraries. You can inquire more about the reputation of the publishers. You can see that uh, are they indexed in different uh, indexing platforms like Scopus, Web of Science, or uh, you know, uh, DOJ. So there are multiple uh, ways that you can easily identify whether this is a predatory journal or not considering that uh, you yourself don't want to get published in predatory journal, right? Sometimes you know, that's what I, I have always felt that 
uh, even authors are more keen to get their name uh, to get their name see on the uh, public platform so that could also be uh, one of the reasons yeah okay thank you sir i guess uh, this question was pretty clear uh, mr rivanti your question has also been answered by ranveer sir uh, okay so we now move on to conclude this session of today's uh, it truly was an enthralling session i am sure that now we all have a great idea of research ethics and that we certainly will be cautious with the predatory journals in our future i'd like to thank our honorable director professor rahul banerjee for his cooperation girdhar sir for initiating and organizing this amazing webinar for all of us the speakers uh, dr priya sandy ma'am uh, ranbir sehde sir and professor gc tikiwal for sparing their time and giving us such valuable information and last but not the least the incredible audience for being such patient full listeners hope you all enjoyed it thank you so much for joining this was your host mr chet signing off yeah thank you thank you very much uh, i just want to thank all wonderful audience for joining us today and uh, i must say it was a good number and uh, my personal thanks to all our wonderful speakers who despite their busy schedule they managed to take out time and spend with us and it was a very interesting session and uh, i am sure all participants are benefited by today's uh, uh, webinar and if anybody uh, still have certain questions which they could not ask uh, they, they are welcome to send us an email and uh, we will try to give you the answers and uh, actually we have shared also a link to receive your digital certificate i hope many of you may have submitted so only after submission of that uh, you know uh, the form you will be sent a digital certificate thank you so very much to each one of uh, you and i particularly would like to thank our master of ceremony this chair for conducting this event so beautifully thank you so much thank you very much uh, professor tikiwal uh, mr ranveer uh, sidhe and uh, dr priya sandhya thank you all very much